This is the story of the rise of a man of great spirit and will and heart. Well, spirituality is, uh, was uh, brought upon me as a kid uh, by my mother, my grandmother, and you know they made us go to church. And Jesus has been with me from from that time until now. And it's something that that I live by, and something that keeps me in line. It is a summer morning at the edge of Atlanta. Evander Holyfield, the three-time world heavyweight champion, attends a Bible study session at World Changers Ministries. For Holyfield, it is his faith that gives meaning to his life. His faith strengthens and restores him. It brings him solace. Well, you know, living for the Lord puts you in peace. I mean that uh, whatever you... Um, Wherever you're standing, you know, uh, the words speak, uh, let your heart not, be, uh, not let your heart be in trouble. The Lord asks you not let your heart be in trouble, so that means for you to be in peace. Uh, the word of God give you peace. I, I, I used to say, I, that's my horse, the black one. I have the Tennessee walking horse. 
I've been thrown twice by that one. Once. I remember. Yeah. I didn't even know she was a girl. Nah, I do. I don't know that much about horses. Well, I would say that if if you had to write a story about my life to this point, you would say, well, here's a man that was born and, and didn't have a father with him. He had a mother of eight. He's the youngest one, and he had to strive hard from the time that he was born to, to, to now. Did this man pay the price? Well, yes, he paid a price, but, you know, his price was that he gave his life to God, which was no price. And so here's a man that was raised up on God from the birth, and he actually tried to do everything that God asked him to do. When no buses or nothing like that, when you went to work, wherever you went, you had to walk, you know. And they had care, but it care wasn't that much but you didn't make no whole lot of money down there, you know. So most, most of the people that couldn't afford a cab or didn't have a car, they walked, you know. Like they had cotton and chalk cotton and taters and pecan, things like that. Evander Holyfield was born October 19, 1962 in Atmore, Alabama, a small town just north of the Florida border. He would be the youngest of eight children. His mother, Annie Holyfield, was a short order cook working long hours at Atmore City Cafe. When I started working at City Cafe, I started at a dishwasher. Then I went from a dishwasher to a, a shard hall. Sally Girl from Sally Girl to a shard hall from that until a head cook. And uh, well, you didn't make no whole lot of money. We did have work from 10 to 10. The remembrance of Alabama is that, you know, we stayed in a house that would probably be considered as a shack. We can see the, see the moons and the stars at night, had holes in the ceiling when it rained. In the family, I'm, I'm the youngest, uh, eight. There's four boys and there's four girls. And um, I guess in my position, I was uh, the little boy that everybody told what to do. Um, I had to listen to everybody. Everybody was responsible uh, for me. Only thing I got was love, which is the most important thing, but as a kid, you just don't realize it. You, you like to have the, the shoes and the clothes and things like that that the older people will get. I got hand-me-downs. Shortly after his birth, Annie Holyfield gave her youngest son the nickname Chubby, Shubby, as she says it, in order to remember a lost friend. That day she just fell on my mind. Shelby run around there playing, and now just look at it. And I thought I'm gonna call him Shelby, so I would never forget Shelby. My mama, my mama started off calling me Chubby, so you know I never was fat, but everybody called me Chubby. It's just a nickname that stuck with me. That my mom, my mama called me Chubby because her girlfriend name was Chubby. After when I wanted her to meet Shelby, I want her to let her know. I never forgot her. I never stopped loving her. I never forgot her. But I didn't get changed to, you know. She never did get changed to meet my son. Brown Prime's vanilla ice cream with um, chocolate, chocolate, dipped in chocolate. I couldn't afford to get it every day. So I got it once every two weeks when I was able to save my money up. Then you get adventurous. You get a brown crown with nuts. And that is chocolate with nuts. With ice cream in the mouth. Well, this, um, we are at, at the Ford County Stadium. But this is the neighborhood I was raised in. This is the first neighborhood that when we moved from Alabama, we moved here when I was three years old, called Summer Hill. Young Evander was unusually energetic, frightening neighbors by climbing anything that was climbable, including telephone poles. But Annie Holyfield found a solution, the Warren Boys Club. And it did work out, cause like when he went to school, go to the boy club, come home, he was too tired, you know. 
climb him over the tree, they want to jump some fence, and want to swing on the limb, you know, things like that, you know. He was too tired to do that. He had done it all over there at the boys' club. I didn't join the boys' club at that time because of quarter. And I um, became a member, and it cost a quarter, and um, I remember getting the, mom, the money from my mom, and I was all excited. I started boxing here, and uh, how I started boxing, I came up from the football field. I came into the gym, and someone was hitting a speed bag. As you can see, over there, when someone's practicing, everybody in the gym can watch. And I want to learn how to hit the speed bag, and I asked the coach, can I, uh, can I hit the speed back? He said, you had to be on a boxing team. So I asked him, he said, no. But every day I would come by and ask him, and finally one day he told me I could. Well, you know, when I started, when I was, when I was young, the glove was like 14 to 16 ounces. And you know, at 65 pounds, the glove kind of reached almost your elbow. And they were so heavy. And when the referees are boxing, usually the guy that get the first shot you usually win because you hit the guy and the other guys start crying and the referee will come in and stop the fight. Evander Holyfield was eight years old. His boxing career had begun. And from the beginning, his ambition and his ability was nurtured by a man who became a second father, the club's boxing coach, Carter Morgan. Morgan was drawn to Holyfield's precocious skills and his work ethic. He told Evander, one day he would be champion of the world. Well, my coach here was uh, named Carter Morgan. He the coach that responsible with my foundation of boxing. He's the coach that gave me the goal that to be a heavyweight champion. And he cared for me as I was his grandson. And he provided things that normally that people that didn't provide unless they were their parents. He gave me shoes, clothes. I feel that he was the person that I was missing in my life. My mother was very strong, but with this man, this man could pull the best out of me. One thing I, he taught, never ask too many questions. If you want to know how to do something, you, you watch and you pay attention, but don't ask any questions. Who is you to ask questions? You ain't smart enough to ask questions yet. So, and so I would learn by watching and, you, and, and just hearing. And he would always enlighten me on things. He would always talk to me. He always said that I was different from the next person. I didn't ask questions. I just did. Didn't, didn't know the reason why I did it. But once I got older, I, I didn't have to ask some questions because I knew the reason why he should jab and throw one, two, three, and things like that. I said, he the one stood by and did for him. And uh, he the one when everybody else went bam, no thank you. He seen what nobody else could see. And I said, now anybody should be praised, it should be him. At age 16, Evander Holyfield lost his first coach and second father. Carter Morgan had died of emphysema. Everything I did in boxing at that point in time, I did it to please him. Because he's a man that treated me like I was a son, a son or grandson. He gave me things and he would take me out of town and he would ensure my mother that he was going to take care of me. Now this man is gone and, you know, and for a while I was just like, no, I don't have no reason to box. I was empty until the 76 Olympic came about and I started watching it on TV then that's when I realized that yeah, I want to make the Olympic team. And that's when I decided to do it for me. Featuring Sugar Ray Leonard, the 1976 U.S. boxing team was perhaps the greatest in American Olympic history, winning five golds. And watching it all, a student at Atlanta's Fulton High began sharpening his focus. Who did I go to senior prom? I, did, I didn't go to the prom. Uh, you know, at the time, didn't have a car and didn't really have the money to afford it. And then, again, I was just so into my boxing, and, if I, and I had the opportunity to either go to prom or go to Canada. I chose to go to Canada to box, and I went there, and I fought in this tournament in Canada, and I won the tournament. After graduating from Fulton High, Holyfield began work at Epps Air Service fueling airplanes. 
the job's demands matured him, Holyfield said. But the modest pay intensified his Olympic aspirations. I realized at one point in time at that work is that pumping gas till you're 65 years old, you know, that's, you know, you know, that could be tough. And we had a guy named Benny that worked there, and uh, Benny was a lot older, had been there with the company for years and years and years, like 13 to 15 years. And to feel that if I worked there 20 more years, 30 years, I can actually just get up to six or seven dollars an hour, you know, it would have been heartbreaking. I was invited to go to Colorado to train on the Olympic team. So, uh, so at that time, I was sitting there at the table with all uh, the people that worked there, all the employees, and I told them, I said, look, get my autograph now, because you're probably going to have to wait in line to get it later. Like that. And they started laughing, don't nobody want your autograph. I said, I'm telling you, you need to get my autograph now. At the Los Angeles Olympics, Evander Holyfield, Fulton High Class of 80, cruised toward the light heavyweight gold medal, easily defeating opponents from Ghana, Iraq, and Kenya. In the semifinals, he faced New Zealand's Kevin Barry, and in the remaining moments of the second round, Holyfield unleashed a pulverizing left hook. referee were counting him out and I was saying to myself no don't count him out I want to get him out cold this is what I'm saying in my mind so the referee then counted him out he stopped then he waited then he came back and he said next time I said stop stop and I said okay then he said you disqualified just as the referee was ordering the boxers to break Holyfield landed his decisive blow stunning many he was judged in violation of the rules and the decision awarded to the battered New Zealander. And they raised his hand and they paraded us around the ring with his hands up. And I, I felt bad then in my mind. I said, no, we in the United States. They can't do this. They're going to overturn this. And I watched Howard Cosell on TV and he said, well, you know, he came on smiling and said, well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that Evander don't lose his medal, but bad news, he don't get a chance to go into the final. Though there was no gold medal match, it was decided Holyfield could keep the bronze he earned for reaching the semifinals. And the gold medalist from Yugoslavia was among many to express support. That really hurt. But, you know, all my life, I had incidents like that, that, well, that I felt that I won, that I didn't get the decision. So it was something that I was accustomed to. But I, but I always knew that it wasn't in the rainbow. I always felt that, you know, it's always something special happens after an uh, incident like that if you just keep the right frame of mind. I fell in love with Evander Holyfield in the 84 Olympics when he had that controversial uh, stoppage at that time. He should have really won the gold in the 84 Olympics. He won it with the bronze. But for the next three days, there was, there was chaos among all the countries there, especially the USA, Cuba, Russia, uh, over the decision that happened uh, to, uh, to Evander. And no time did I see him waver. I was with him for those three days. He just kept a low tone, just kept, uh, uh, just kept saying whatever would happen is going to happen, you know. He never, everybody was running around shouting all over the place. And I saw the mental strength in this guy here. These are Joan, uh, Joan Burr North Apartments. I moved in here when I was 12 years old. Oh. And uh, apartment here, 86, was the lucky apartment. This is where that uh, uh, I grew up in uh, quite an experience. And, uh, but it's funny, this apartment here was a lot better than the home that we stayed in. I stayed in these uh, apartments to 1984. Coming back and then seeing these young kids, and knowing that, you know, for me to be here, the show will inspire them that, you know, you don't have to live here all your life. It's not where you're at, it's where you're going. And that, you know, I came from here and look where I'm at right now at the time. And so, you know, this is going to inspire these kids to, you know, want to be better. 
He's a gentle human being outside of the ring. He's soft-spoken, but in that ring, he's like a Ray Leonard. He's the, all the great ones have that, that, uh, that quality. He's just, he's the kind of guy, if he was back in Greece, he'd have a sword in his hand and he'd be out in the sawdust coming at you, you know, and you wouldn't want to see that. He, he, uh, he's a bayonet fighter. He wants to get in there with you but, and get close. He doesn't want any fooling around. He's in a fist fight. As a pro, Holyfield's rise was swift. Just two years after his Olympic disappointment, he was fighting for the junior heavyweight title. It was July 12, 1986. His opponent, Dwight Muhammad Kawi, was heavily favored. I was fighting a guy that I know, the ferocious, and I fighting a guy that had a reputation pounding people bigger than him. I mean, he was 5'7", but he was, you know, he was everything that everybody said he was. And everybody making that excuse and said, why is they putting Holyfield in there with the toughest man at this time? He only been fighting two years. You know, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I said, Lord, just let me do the best that I can. Came down to the fourth round. He put that relentless pressure on me that I started tiring out. Fourth round, you know, I didn't feel that I had any stamina, and, and this guy was pressuring me, and I just said, you know, Lord, just, just let me last. You know, I didn't ask the Lord to let me win. I just asked him, let me last. His prayers were answered. These were among the last of an incredible 1,200 punches launched by Holyfield in the 15-round bout. fight was over, it was a tough fight, and I didn't think about winning. Only thing I was saying in my mind, Lord, I'm, I just thank you for letting me make 15 rounds. It, it didn't make no difference who won the fight. Judge Quintana scores the fight 147-138 for the winner and new I remember leaving, leaving the arena, going back to the hotel, and I had to go to the hospital because I had dehydrated, I had lost 15 pounds. I felt terrible. And you know, for, for about three or four months, I felt terrible. Holyfield's victory over Kawi had been judged the fight of the year. On March 11, 1989, in Las Vegas, he opposed former heavyweight champion Michael Dokes. Ring Magazine would call it the fight of the decade. After the ninth round, I came back to the corner and I was sitting on the stoop. And I remember my, my corner man, Ace, Ace Morano, said, Call Jesus. And I said, Jesus, please help me. And the bell rung. I went back and I had a new, I had a new, I felt, felt felt like I had a little bit more energy going out in that 10th round. And he did, he made some mistakes and I was able to capitalize and I knocked him out in that 10th round. next goal was to keep looking for better and better ways to keep him motivated, to keep him uh, sharp, uh, implementing things like deep tissue massage work, uh, uh, good, highly researched vitamin supplements, um, 
better way to train, better equipment to train on. So it's, it's just the goal is once one goal is met, there's another goal right behind it. The whole purpose was to, to get him a heavyweight title fight, that, that Project Omega. And, I, and as I told the Duvis, when the bell rang for the first round with Buster Douglas, their project is over. It was just like a final exam. You went to school for all that time now. This one day is going to make the difference what type of person you are. Some eight months after shocking Mike Tyson, Buster Douglas makes the first defense of his undisputed heavyweight title. And for the first time, the challenger's mother, Annie Holyfield, has asked her son to win this one for her. I, w I went out there and I looked right through Buster Douglas at the time. And I just can see that, I can see that I'm gonna win this fight. I was looking at him so hard that he just, his eyes just dropped. He couldn't look me in my eye. And from that point on, I can sense that it was already, it was already over. This is for the big championship of the world. Protect yourself at all times. Any questions from the challenger is two seconds. Any questions from the champion or is two seconds. Let's get it on. Here we go. that I couldn't do it because I was a small man. So this would, you know, display to the kids that, you know, if you work hard, and train hard, and work at anything, you can, you can be successful. Hundreds lined the streets, waving and shouting to Annie Holyfield, the mayor and city police chief behind her. Well behind them, flanked by marching bands, the champion, Mrs. Holyfield's son, raised in an Atlanta housing project, nicknamed and still called Chubby by his mother. Today, her little boy is the pride of all of Atlanta. Mrs. Holyfield says he was a quiet child, he wasn't a bully. He made people laugh, he went to school, he got his first part-time job at the stadium at age 15. I, I talk, you know, just how to respect everybody, like he treat everybody as he want to be treated. And on behalf of the people of the city of Atlanta, hereby I proclaim the month of November, 1990, as Evander Holyfield Month in Atlanta in appreciation of his many contributions to our city. I'm honored and lost for words, and I just want to say I love you all. Thanks. You know, Evander is his own man. He, he has his own style, he has his own lifestyle, you know, the way he carries himself, uh, his upbringing, he's a gentleman, he, he doesn't, he's not a boisterous type of person, he's not uh, vulgar, 
and uh, it, it's uh, nothing that's put on. It's just the way he is. And uh, but he's in a game when a lot of people don't appreciate that type of a uh, fighter. They want the uh, boisterous, loud, you know, egotistical guy. You know, but he's just not that way. Undisputed heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield defends his title against former champion George Foreman. The challenger, Morgan Cooper. All right, gentlemen, this is for the championship of the world. Evander all the instructions, expect a tough, clean fight. Protect yourself at all times. Any questions from Mr. Holmes corner? Any questions from Mr. Holmes in his corner? Let's get up! to win each and every time I come by here. You know, everybody have their day. I get better, and I know I will. And I make them eat every word that they say. The only problem I have with Evander uh, is, and sometimes him and I have other real, real big arguments on, is sometimes, where's the best Italian restaurant to go to eat, and uh, where to go bowl, and uh, he's a stickler for when it comes to bowling, you know? And he's gotta beat me all the time. That's all he's gotta win, he's gotta win all the time, you know? But he's a competitor. And this shows you what kind of a competitor is, whether, whether it be uh, going to select uh, an Italian restaurant or whether go uh, go bowling. I mean, I mean, he's out there competing with you all the time, you know? It was 1992. And despite a 28-0 record, the world heavyweight champion was still seeking widespread respect. But then, in a one-year span, came two bouts that defined him as a boxer and a man. A crowd of 18,000 awaits the fourth title defense for Evander Holyfield, a defense which now becomes the biggest test for respect in his two-year reign as champion. Can Evander Holyfield beat a heavyweight who is both younger and bigger than himself? 
That is what we're here to find out. On the red on Bo's trunks and the red tassels on his shoes. From time immemorial in Africa, red symbolizes royalty. Too smart, too smart, too slick, baby, too slick out there. <laughs> It was already a special event after the first nine rounds. You could see Bo growing into the task and learning a little bit about being in that kind of a war. You could see Holyfield, as Evander always did, giving everything he had to the task. Going into the fight, the questions were whether Bo had the heart or the stamina to stand up to a very well-conditioned, highly motivated, tough champion like Evander Holyfield. And for the most part, Bo had answered those questions in the affirmative coming into the 10th round. Gentlemen, all this time, you can't understand someone being so dirty. There was a moment, almost a suspended moment, when you could see that Bo had suddenly become arm weary. I had thoughts, and I had one foot up on the stairs. I, uh, and maybe stop him from getting hurt. But knowing the heart of, uh, of Evander, I think he probably would have never forgave me. Bo should be taking that kind of advice. became of Andrews round. And he began rocking Riddick Bow. So much so that though Evander had been staggered, driven into the ropes, buckled, not necessarily in that order, one of the three judges gave that round to Evander Holyfield. Bow fought the fight of his life. Whether he can ever repeat it again, I don't know. In round 11, Bo was spectacular. Holyfield in serious trouble now. Bo has got to be cool trying to finish him, though. There's the uppercut again. The mouthpiece is out of Holyfield's mouth. And he's got to go down. And Holyfield gets up very early in the count. Two. Two. Second time in his career he's been knocked down. New heavyweight champion of the world. It made me feel that the same way I felt when I lost my first amateur bout. And I lost my first amateur bout when I was 11 years old. And I know how bad it hurt. All of a sudden, I just wanted to quit. I didn't want to do, have nothing to do with boxing anymore because now all this invincibility is gone. And I didn't want to go. But I remember my mama said, I didn't raise no quitter. You don't quit because of circumstances. Uh, Riddick hasn't put in a whole lot of work, and when he meets up with Evander Holyfield, he's going to meet a man who's on a mission, uh, definitely out to get revenge and a vendetta. I always come back. I always come back. Evander Holyfield weighs in at 217 pounds. Somebody's got to pay. They got 
gotta pay. You gotta pay, champ. Help Holyfield to fight to his strengths, Lord, yep. and to capitalize on Reddick's weakness. Yes, we claim it, Lord. Lord, as Holyfield's fight's a smart fight, we know you'll give him the strength and the stamina to have the victory. From Atlanta, Georgia, the challenger and former You know, I walk by faith and not by sight. You know, I promise everybody that I will win this. And he did it like this! And he did it like this! And he did it like that! Everything I have done, it was in vain to a lot of people because everybody looked at Tyson as the invincible one, the one that couldn't be beat. And you know, even after he had been beaten, they felt that he only beat himself. And so regardless to whatever I accomplished, uh, people were saying, they said, well, you know, you didn't beat Tyson. And Tyson was pretty much the measuring stick to pretty much all the boxers. Styles make fights. And in life, the person that's a flexible, the person that's able to adapt to different styles is the one going to have a, a better run. Tyson was pretty much was a one-dimensional fighter, meaning that what he did, he did very well, but he had one way of doing it. If anyone could withstand the pressure he put on and was able to bag him back, then Tyson wouldn't be able to change. I would have to say after all the fights that I ever fought in my life, that had to be one of the most complete fights I ever fought. My mind never wavered from the first round to the 11th round to I take him out. I was focused and I was able to follow a game plan and you know, I was able to just thank the Lord for what he allowed me to do. And people look and they say, what you mean by led by the spirit? And see, and people don't realize that when you're led by the spirit, God will only allow you to be the best that you could be. You know, when you choose to believe yourself, then you, you got it going on. But if you have to count on other people to believe in you, they, they are railroad you from your belief because people love to say what one can do. You know, I love what I'm doing, and I can win that way. And people say, nah, good guys finish last, but they got an opportunity to see the whole world that good guys don't finish last. People with determination, whether they're good or bad, can be winning if they just work hard and never give up. One thing I know, you go, you don't have to go nowhere to learn bad things. Anything good, you got to work at it. I love my daddy. <laughs> People honor me and I honor them back and forth, back and forth to the point where that here I am today. My first coach honored me by doing things for me, which uh, made me honor him. My mother honored me by taking care of me and instilling love in me, so I honor her. So everybody honored me, I turned around and did the same thing, honored them. You honor Lord by trying to live for him and try to carry out his will by standing in this world and knowing what to do. The Lord has taught me that we have to love each other, but number one, being able to love yourself. Once you learn to love yourself, then you can love your neighbor right. And, and that's what it all amount to, being able to love one another. The credit, said Theodore Roosevelt, belongs to the man who was in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood.
who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause. Who at best, if he wins, knows the thrills of high achievement, and if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat.